Okay, so there's an article from Richard Rennie on the front page right at the moment, Farmers Weekly, and it reads the headline, Think Local Push, from, of course, Minister Shane Jones. And he's regarding, this is in regards, sorry, to when it comes to our local foresters uh, driving more wood first into our local wood processing. This is among uh, many initiatives we're going to be talking to Shane Jones about and joins us now. Kia ora, sir. Kia ora. Hello, folks. Greetings from the Bay of Islands. Wonderful spot that you are uh, isolated in there, Shane. A few chunky topics that we're going to get through tonight. Uh, first, let's talk about this. How do you believe the government are going to be able to intervene and, in, of course, what's always been market forces, telling these foresters uh, where to sell their logs? Well, I would remind the forestry industry that the dairy farmers are already required through Fonterra to make milk available to their competitors. So it's not as if the primary sector don't have working examples already in existence where the owners of primary sector assets contribute to maintaining other New Zealand businesses. The forestry sector has been well served by this government and this particular minister has stood up against the attacks from a host of other interest in rural New Zealand associated with hill country farming and it's now time for the forestry sector to show reciprocity and to direct a suitable amount of their raw product to sustain domestic downstream processing and the jobs that will grow in value in these areas in the uh, rural environment that we need to continue to sustain jobs in. Okay, we understand the unemployment woes that are downstream for our country post-COVID, Shane. Um, but you're saying this isn't a quota-like system, yet uh, how are you going to be able to administrate this? So I came from the fishing industry, and I was the chairman of the Māori Fisheries Commission and Sea Lords before I became a politician. So I am very aware of how treacherous it is in dealing with quotas. There has been some misinformation, and I've been quite um, uplifted, actually, by the attitude shown by a number of the senior identities in the forest ownership community who do accept that they hold a position of extraordinary privilege because they're the only type of primary sector activity that has been given the light touch in our overseas investment criteria. Horticulture, agriculture, floriculture, all have an extraordinary high threshold, a bar to pass in order to attract overseas investment. That is not the case with forestry. Shane, so was, a lot, a was a lot of that directed to getting the funds in around your billion trees program though and how we were going to be able to uh, scale that up yeah this so there's, uh, yeah there's no shortage of opportunity for us to work with farmers and we've got proposals at the moment to hugely increase the amount of tree planting to get better water outcomes including fencing but just on the question of the foreign owned forestry interests they know that we are uh, willing to pass legislation to get a better outcome so that the New Zealand businesses have fair access to this raw material, not just international markets in China. Okay, when you're talking about this farmland, uh, a lot of marginal Māori land is, of course, sitting there ripe as opposed to uh, your uh, opposition that to the fact of right tree, right place um, leading into this. What, what sort of work have you got going on into the PGP fund to shift this tree expansion into that mar marginal Māori land? Yeah, you ask a very good question. There's, a, there's swathes of Māori land and unfortunately it's blighted by a very problematic ownership structure. We have um, a host of absentee owners and the whole hapu owns the land and no one wants to take responsibility. We've actually put quite a bit of dough into tidying all that up, and we are also now investing more money in water storage. Water storage is absolutely essential for enhancing the productivity of Māori land. I should say all land. However, my mandate is to work in those neglected areas of the north where there's been 
almost a biblical-like drought in the way in which it's afflicted the north, the businesses and the communities and more isolated parts of the, um, the Bay of Plenty. So I'm very keen for us to proceed with, uh, with speed and expeditiously so that we can marry our water funding to the aspirations of the landowners, generate jobs and turn the capacity of that land to a higher value of um, exports and over time foreign exchange earnings. And it, to me, it's a win-win situation. Now, where people want to plant trees to get better water outcomes, obviously our party in New Zealand First doesn't want to see very many um, onerous regulations placed on the primary sector as they gather momentum to try and trade our way out of our COVID problems. But we think that by planting trees, fencing streams, working sensibly with landowners and encouraging my senior colleague, Mr. David Parker, to come up with a solution that gets the buy-in from the farmers, irrespective of the papa, whether they're Pākehā farmers, Māori farmers, corporate farmers, whatever they are, I think that's going to be a good outcome prior to the election and it reflects the new changed circumstances that have been driven by this COVID affliction. I love how you said that prior to the election. This is what we're trying to um, work out around what is campaigning at the moment and what is actual economic recovery, Shane. Now, talking about water storage, Bruce said it's good to have water storage on the table, Shane, but uh, initially you were, were all about small storage dams and not these large storage uh, systems, which as we've seen in places like the Waimea that have been about urban as well as rural ir irrigation but urban things like salutation from the sea uh, our urban water supply can benefit benefit from a lot of these large water storage programs just as much have you swung back to the more larger scale rural regional infrastructure projects well i must uh, be very truthful here sarah i have had contact with some of the proponents and interests associated with the Waimea scheme you may recall in 2018, it was one of the schemes that our government enabled to proceed with some Crown Poutier, some funding. Uh, they are circling around uh, the Crown as to whether or not we're able to assist them with the shortfall that they have. Now, in the event that that's the direction they want to head in, as Infrastructure and Provincial Growth Minister, I'll work with Damien O'Connor and bring back a proposal to our colleagues I think it would be um, rather perverse if the uh, project has to be abandoned two-thirds of the way through. However, I, I do have to remind everyone that my water storage investments as the steward of the Provincial Growth Fund, they are not on the mega scale of the projects such as Waimea and Central Plains. They are important, however, in the north, and whether or not the Waimea example is a distinctive case where the Crown has to give some additional putia. I'll take that proposal forward in the event that I receive it to my colleagues. <clears throat> yeah, and we could talk about water storage to the cows come home, Shane, myself and you, and don't even mention the yeah, tuki tuki. Um, but let's move on in regards to rural broadband connectivity. It's, a, it's obviously a passion of yours uh, at the moment to, to make sure that we can reform this economy. Uh, how do you believe it's going to happen and, and what hasn't happened under a national government's extensive spending in broadband? Well, ordinarily, it's my style to um, bash the uh, opposition. <laughs> but Sarah, I, I, I would remind us all that digital um, rollout was a key feature of Stephen Joyce and the national government's response to the economic downturn after 08 and 09. And in many respects, uh, New Zealand communities have been handsomely the beneficiary of that rollout. So I don't want to be capricious and not acknowledge that. However, in some areas in the north, unfortunately, I do have lunatics running around here burning down, um, uh, burning down towers. So God knows how mm. I'm going to affect you know, digital connectivity. You've got Hone, Shane. <laughs> Theorists burning them down. That's ridiculous. And I hope the police catch them. Sorry, I, I just said you've got Honay, Shane. You should be right. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> well, funny enough, Honay Harawira and the other Iwi leaders have been the ones on my case to actually encourage the other ministers to continue investing in uh, cell towers and get better digital connectivity, especially if we're going to get 
our young men and women uh, in the more isolated parts of rural New Zealand to go and do work, for example, on cowrie dieback and other such schemes, very hard to uh, maintain momentum in those areas if you don't have digital connectivity because of the lifestyles that a lot of our young people have. So look, $15 million has been announced by Chris Pa'afoy. Uh, it will be rolled out by Crown Infrastructure Partners, chaired by Mark Binns, who more recently has achieved um, some repute as the person putting together the $125 billion list of shovel-ready projects. So I'm going to back digital connectivity, but I'm very much a pillion passenger. Chris Pa'afoy, who's our um, communications minister, uh, he's making most of the big calls, and I'm really just happy to support him. Um, Shane, just before we part, I just want to ensure, I mean, you, obviously in the title of your party is New Zealand First and has always been that. Um, there's a lot coming out swinging at your leaders' comments that we need to steer away from globalisation. You do realise that we're a large trading nation at the bottom of the world. I think what my leader is pointing out is that the COVID uh, affliction has proved to us that we must not denude ourselves of key essential industries in New Zealand. If you are totally reliant on global supply chains that have either clogged up or completely collapsed, it's important we get a better balance between sustaining key institutions in our own sovereign nation and not outsourcing everything. That is a very credible political perspective to reflect. It's one that we will campaign on. However, to suggest that we're turning our back uh, like Luddites on international trade is not only factually wrong, it reflects desperation from our political opponents. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us out of the beautiful Bay of Islands, Minister for Regional Development, Shane Jones. This is Sarah's Country.